The scripture reading will be from 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5, if you want to follow along. I'll be reading out of the King James Version. That's 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Good morning, family. Glad you are here this morning. We are blessed to be here with God's children, worshiping our God from our heart in spirit and truth. And that being said, it's the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Glad because we're here and glad because we're here with God. Uh, what a blessing that is. We want to welcome our visitors. If you are someone who are, is visiting us, we love having you. Uh, we look forward to your return at our next established time, which is 6 o'clock this evening. For those of you that do not know, we are getting together again. Imagine that. Coming together to worship our God. Another portion of His Word. Learning to sustain our life and to be sustained by the life that is in Christ Jesus. We are blessed to be here today and I'm grateful for each and every one of you. You know, God's power is worthy of talking about. Worthy of revealing. Worthy of letting people see. You know, we had a VBS a couple of weeks ago that I think really displayed the power of God working within each and every one of us. From the lion all the way to the princess or the angel that, you know, didn't come in like a wrecking ball, but came in like a whirlwind and delivered a great message of God's deliverance God's way of leading us home and what a great way to give a segue to what we're about to jump in uh, to our lesson this morning you know our lesson is, is about problems you know I've had people tell me say well you're going to regret that in the morning so I sleep until noon because I'm a problem solver we are problem solvers. And, and the way we solve problems is through God's word. We have a problem in this world today of doubt. The way to solve that problem is to remove that doubt and trust in God. I'll give you a couple examples. The wise man and the foolish man talked about in, in Matthew chapter 7. One man built his house on sand. He wasn't a problem solver because we see what happened. When that house fell, he had no one to blame but himself because he didn't build that house on the right foundation. But there was a wise man who trusted God, who trusted in what Jesus taught him. And he built that house upon a rock. And according to Hebrews chapter 12, he built it on a foundation that is not shakable. It cannot be destroyed. It is going to last forever. Now, when you study the Bible and you look at Bible studies and, and you look at reading the Bible, there's a few things that we have to understand. The Bible is a great book of contrast. It always shows evil versus good, especially in the book of Revelation. And, you know, it's the evil people that say, whoa, that book's too scary to read. But... The Christians say, no, it's a great book because we come out of there saying, woohoo, not boohoo. Right? It's the book of woohoo, not the book of boohoo. Because we're Christians, we understand the problem is doubt. The problem is not believing in God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, Victor did a great job talking about putting faith in God's gospel this morning. 
the introduction to his class, and that's what faith is. It, it, it's trusting in God. It's not letting the world pull us off our understanding of who God is, because we, in faith, see God as, God as a rewarder of those who truly seek him. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is the world doesn't seek God. And so their character is not of the rock character, building that foundation upon a rock, but a, a character of, of timidity, of something that isn't right with God. In Romans chapter 5, if you look over at verses 3 and 4, in Romans chapter 5, let's go over there, Verses 3 and 4, it says, And not only this, but we exalt, we build upon, we grow, we take up to the Lord. We put that on high. We exalt what? Our tribulations. Are you kidding me? That's right. We exalt. We're built up. We're being strengthened in these tribulations. Knowing, here it is, our lives are changed by this knowledge. This makes us different people. This knowledge, this understanding, this faith, this power to walk, even though there's tribulations, walking through those tribulations, being built up, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, more building, proven character. And proven character brings hope. The next verse says, and the hope that God gives us does not disappoint. What a beautiful concept that is. Look at the battle going on. Within each and every one of us. Paul talked about it. It's going on within him. Every one of us have this battle. We're going to, are we going to doubt God? Or are we going to be faithful to God? Are we going to trust in God? Are we going to walk with God? That's important to us because we want to be kingdom dwellers. Right? We want to go home. Like Daniela showed us in the VBS meeting. You already know how to go home. And that is to trust in God. We triumph in the battle of doubt. We triumph. We're not losers. We're not victims. We're victors. You're a victor, but I'm a victor too. I'm a victor in Christ Jesus because I don't doubt God's power, folks. This is the part. This is where the world struggles. They don't get this. They doubt God's power. It goes like, Mm, there ain't no way that can happen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's how I read cookbooks. Thank you. <laughs> we don't doubt God's promises. God's made some promises, folks. And those promises are conditional on what? If we don't doubt them. If we trust them. If we let them work in our lives. And then here's the big one. that We, we don't doubt God's providence. I can't do anything unless God provides for me. And that's, that's always helpful uh, to understand 1 John 1, 5. Do, 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 we, do, do we get what 1 John 1, 5 says? Let's go over there and look at that. Because this is, this is key to what we're talking about. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Do we see that? There is nothing to doubt in God. Everything that God gives us is light. Don't let the world tell you, oh, that's a gray area. No, it's not. It's either light or it's dark. It's either yeah or nah. And this is the way God works. The book of contrast. The question is, do we doubt him or do we trust him? What about his power? You know, I know Romans 1.16 is very, very clear, and I don't know how people miss it, but they do, because they doubt God's power. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why isn't he ashamed? Well, I'm glad you asked, because he tells us right in that verse, because it is the power of God unto salvation. I don't, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of man's uh, wisdom to come. No, 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 no. It's the power of God to save people. Do we trust it or do we doubt it? Do we believe in God? Do we walk with God? The whole idea of God is he's transforming us. It's called transformation. He's transforming us from the flesh to spirit, 
Folks, we are spiritual people dressed in flesh. We are not fleshly, uh, fleshly people uh, with a spirit. We are spiritual people that is dressed in flesh, and we have to work with that. We have to overcome that because there's two people in the Bible, those who dwell on the earth and those who what? Overcome. We will overcome this fleshly garb that we wear through our faith in God. And that's what transformation is. Transformation comes from the, uh, the transfer of power. Do I give flesh power or do I give my faith power? Like the Alaskan with the, with the uh, dogs that were fighting, and he'd always bet on the winning dog. And his son asked him, how do, you, how do you know which one wins? He says, it's the one I feed. That's the one that's going to win. And that's the same thing in our battle. It's the one we feed. Are we feeding the flesh? Or are we feeding the faith? Are we being strengthened by God? The power that God has is to build, yes, but also to keep it built. Because the world is in the... the habit of tearing down the foundation that God builds on is, is the power of that rock and that rock will stand forever so how does God do that with us well he, he pours his life into us turn in your Bible let's go to 2nd Timothy and let's look at chapter 1 and let's look at verses 7 and 8 because this is kind of going to explain to us how God gets all this done you know, you and I can't do it. We have to trust in God. We have to let him have the power to lead us there. Chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, very clear. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Are we hearing that? We're not cowards. It didn't say we won't fear, but we will not let fear stop us from having the power of God to overcome whatever it is we fear. And I'm going to throw the hardest one at us, death. Death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God, he's given us victory through Christ Jesus to overcome that power. We are no longer timid about death. It's not the spirit of timidity, he says, but the power and love and discipline. What does God do? He pours into us the love, the timidity. Uh, wrong answer. That's what we don't have, a spirit of timidity, but of power, God's power. God's power. It's uncomprehensible. It is unconquerable, and it is unstoppable. This is the power of God. It's man and his doubt that stop this power from working. It's love. And I love 1 Corinthians 13. You know how it ends in mean, its description of love? Love never fails. Woohoo! It's victorious. God is love. Love never fails. God is victorious. And those of his seed, his offspring, we are victorious also because we are children of that power, of that love. But it's also got discipline, power, love, and discipline. And that is the ability of having sound judgment, knowing what's right and wrong, and having the self-control to do right and turn away from what's wrong. You remember in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, I love that verse because it talks about we are overwhelmingly conquerors. What does that mean? Well, we're supposed to lose. We're supposed to lose. But we conquer. Overwhelmingly, it means like out of nowhere, we come in and conquer. Because everything's against us, folks. Everything in the world, everything in the flesh, everything the world is trying to teach us is against what God has shown us what is victory. So the power to overcome fear. We have that power. I give you that spirit of power. Revelation 2 did. Do, do not fear what you're about to suffer. The devil's about to cast some of you in prison. Be faithful until death. Do not let fear stop you from being faithful. Receive the crown of life. Power to overcome death. Love. How many of us don't have enemies? Please don't raise your hand. Because if you are a Christian, you have enemies. And the main enemy is Satan himself, right? But we get this. Love that God gives us is to defeat our enemy. What did Jesus say to do with our enemies? Love them. 
love your enemies. Woohoo! That's power. That there's power in that love. I had a friend who used to tell me all the time, you want to destroy your enemy, make him your friend. Right? You want to destroy your enemy, Jesus said, make him a disciple. Teach him, love him, pray for him, do things that they aren't looking for to win that soul. And discipline, yes, to persevere even through the trials we face. I'm so grateful for the prayers that we offer. Rusty did a good job today remembering, remembering that we lose loved ones. And those are trials that we face, but we don't give up. You know, Corey Ten Boom was a survivor of the Holocaust, and you know, he wrote about being on a train through a tunnel. So you don't jump off the, tu the, the train. You have faith in the engineer to get you to the other side. And that's what discipline does. It gets us through those trials. We don't jump the train. You know, we simply hold on to God. This is what discipline does. It doesn't let us give up. It doesn't let us give in. It just helps us to give all. This is what God's power does. This is what transformation means. To surrender my power for God's power. God had the power to create that man. It's done, we, we, we do some different building and creating some ideas and stuff. But you know what? We don't re usually create, man doesn't at least, uh, create with the idea of his fellow man in mind. The comfort, the well-being, you know? I mean, I'm a firm believer that the inventor of the doorbell never had a dog. He wasn't concerned with my welfare. But he built a great invention called the doorbell. My dog doesn't like it. Not many do. But you know what this reminds me? How much better that makes God's power. God's power creates with us in mind. He gives us the ability to have that power to conquer, overwhelmingly conquer, the things around us, the things that the world is trying to throw at us, and the greatest one that they use is doubt. We have the power in God to overcome that doubt. We not only have the power to overcome doubt, but we have the power, we have the understanding that, that we don't doubt God's promises. God makes promises, we can take it to the bank. You know, Peter had to write to him and say, don't, don't, don't get stressed, now this is Cubs version, you know, don't get, get stressed out, you know, God's not slow. His promises are true, but he's being patient, you know, because they were saying like, yeah, when's this judgment going to happen, dude? You know, it's been like 20 years since Christ died, and I ain't seen no judgment yet. No, 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 he's not slow. He's being patient. Those promises are going to come true. And so what we get from that is we want to believe in those promises. You know, we had a, a great weekend uh, for some of us, a four-day weekend where this nation celebrated freedom. And this idea of this lesson came from that concept. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says it was for what? Freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. The power of God has freed us from the doubts of this world. The, the downfall of this world is their doubt. They're doubting God. In that same chapter in verse 13, for you will call to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. See where the church leaves the world? We don't let this freedom in Christ be an opportunity for the flesh to say, we can do whatever we want to do. No, 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 we're not that dumb, right? We get it. We've been freed in Christ not to sin, but to avoid sin, to let God's power do away with that sin. But through love, serve one another. This is God's plan. And this is His promise that we'll have this church right here at Sun Valley, this congregation, this church, the Lord's church established right here at Sun Valley to serve one another, to strengthen that love, to trust in God's promises. The power of God, folks, 
is faith in his promise. What's his promise? Life. Now I know we're like Adam and Eve. Well, what do you mean, Cub? Everybody else is living. What are you talking about? Well, they're not living the life. Victor, again, for th those of you that aren't making it on Sunday morning to these classes, there's some really good stuff being uh, presented out here. And Victor talked about that. What is, what is life to God? It's being right with God. It's having his spirit within us, guiding us. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Those who are being led by the spirit, these are children of God. These are alive to God. These guys are living the life that God has given us. And God sent us his wisdom. The beauty of his wisdom. Turn in your Bibles. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look at verse uh, 20 and 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. No, this way. Paul writing, where is the wise man? Where are you at? Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the lawyer? Where's all you knowledgeable people? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Where are you at? We know where you are physically. We don't, don't, don't look at me like I'm dumb, please. I know where you are physically, but where are you at in your mindset? Are you a fool or are you a wise man? Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom, God has wisdom enough to understand that man's wisdom couldn't create God. In his wisdom, he said the world through its wisdom did not even come to know God. This is not oida. This is not a relationship. No, this is a basic understanding of who God is. Man's wisdom can't get you there. It takes the wisdom of God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And we have to understand some things here. We have to get this. We can't doubt God's promise. God promised life. The power of God is faith in that promise of his life. God's promise of his wisdom. Man's wisdom can't get us there. The life that God gives us comes through his wisdom. Man's wisdom just gets us death. Flesh is death. God's wisdom sent his wisdom to overcome that foolishness. So we want to call his wisdom foolishness, but he found pleasure calling that foolishness wisdom to lead us into the life that he's given us. Folks, that is the power of to overcome the doubt of God's promises through his wisdom. And look at his works. Man works so hard to get himself in a mess. You know, I know marriages that fall apart because men and women work so hard to get it that way. You know, because we doubt God. We, he tells us how to have a successful marriage. He tells us how to live in peace. He tells us how to live in harmony. He tells us how to live in love. And yet we doubt him and we try things our own way and we mess it up. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 is clear that God has promised us that he's going to work things out. Even in bad marriages. In verse 28 it's very clear, we know that's that word order. Our lives are built by this. Our lives are changed by this knowledge that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, right? You get that? Not to everybody, but to those who love God. Not the world's love. I love you, God, but, well, that just turned into really light, so it's no longer love. God's love doesn't know no but. It just says, I love, so I do. That's the love. Those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Folks, God promises to work in our lives, to make even bad situations good. This is the power of God, to trust in his promises, not doubt them. I know a lot of people that have a lot of good things to do but are fearful of what could happen if they do them. And I say, wait a minute, God says do them and he'll work it out for good. Why? Because we love him and we're called according to his purpose. That's his promise. So do I have to fear evangelism? Uh, no, I don't. That's the wrong answer to fear it. But to do it and let God work it out. 
And he's going to work it out for good. Isaiah 55 says, his word will not come back to him void or empty. It's going to do what God wants it to do. But are we going to do what God wants us to do? This is the question. This is where doubt plays. The world has doubt in what God promises. God promises eternal life. Obviously, there's some kind of doubt there. Or this room would be filled. You understand that? This room would be filled if they didn't doubt God's promise of eternal life. His love is unconditional, but His promises are conditional. The promise of love, the promise of eternal life comes through those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, not man's. And His purpose is not to doubt His promises. And then the promise of His Word, that same book, Romans chapter 8, you go to verse uh, chapter 9, look at verses 8 and 9. This is it. Not the children of the flesh who are children of God. You hearing that? Not the children of the flesh. Not the people that are born in the flesh. But the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. The children of what? The promise. What's the promise? The life. The eternal life. Do you doubt that promise? I don't doubt it. I have faith in it. I am who I am because God says this is who I can be. I tried what Cub thought he could be, and I'm so grateful that God used transformation. That his love called me to the waters of baptism, allowed me to wash away my sins, to have my sins washed away, to be raised to walk in a newness of life, now life that is controlled by God himself. Through his spirit, through his guidance. The whole idea of this verse is about Sarah. She didn't believe that this was possible, that she could have a child, but Isaac was born. The promise of the blessing, the promise of the life that God promised in the seed promise, the life promise was made fulfilled, even though we don't believe it, even though we doubt, folks, God says, don't doubt. Trust in me. 1 John chapter 5, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, we write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That's the church. Because we don't just believe in the name of Jesus. We believe in the name of the Son of God. That everything he says, everything he's about, his doctrine, his teaching, his church, his family, his people, his faith. We believe in that. So that you may know you have eternal life. I don't doubt him. Now somebody, that's pretty arrogant. No, no, no. There's a difference between faith and arrogance. There's a difference between hope and arrogance. There's a difference between love and arrogance. Love and hope and faith all believe and trust in God, not cub. That would be arrogance. It's not my ability. It's not my power. It's not my promise. It's God. I believe in his promise. When he says, I can know I have eternal life, I believe that. First thing I need to know, though, is what's been written. So, yeah, God has given us the, the power to overcome the doubt of the world that they have in his promises. I want to share something with you real quick. Second Peter chapter one. I want us to look over there. Second Peter chapter one. I want us to see verses 20 and 21. But know this first of all, Peter says, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. God did not leave this to man. Look what man has done. Look what he did. How many churches, so-called churches, are in this world? The Bible says God only built one. Man's done the rest of it by their own interpretation. It's not a matter of one's own interpretation. Now watch this. You're ready, guys. The hair on the back of your neck is about ready to stand up. Watch. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit from God. Where did this message come from? Men moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to show you. Somebody told me the difference between 
a gospel preacher and a people preacher is a people preacher will get up because he thinks he has to say something. A gospel preacher gets up because he has something to say. That's true in this sense of what's being taught here. Because in this, in this message, it's very clear. There are preachers that are out there preaching for money. And they carry the word out to others. Their word. And they carry that out to others. But here's the true preacher. The true preacher is one who is carried by the word to speak God's message. Now remember we go back to that Romans passage where it says the message preached. That's key. It's God's message, and if I'm his preacher, I don't change it. I simply preach it. It's God's message. It's God's power. That same chapter 1 um, reminds us of a lot of great things in 2 Peter. But God has made promises that when we let the Spirit carry us to take the word out, then, then we are preaching his message. We are doing something that the world doesn't understand. We are trusting God and his promises to get the word out. There's a guy, little boy was happy about his grandma, uh, grandmother coming over, right? And so he's got really excited. Oh, grandma, he ran to her and put his arms around her, hugged her in there. So I'm glad you're here, glad you're here. Grandma said, well, what's going on? He said, well, now daddy gets to do that trick that he's been promising to do. And grandma said, well, what in the world is that? He said, I heard dad tell mom the other day that he's going to climb the wall if you come back. Well, God's promises, unlike men's, are more than words. They're truth. And God's truth is carried out. When we don't doubt God, when we don't doubt his promises, God's word is carried out, not only in the words that we speak, but in the life that we live. We trust in God. We follow God. We preach God. We reveal God who is light to a dying world. And this is the kicker. This is the providence of God. We don't doubt God's providence. I want us to catch a verse, Ephesians chapter 5, and I want us to look at verse 29, because there's something here that sometimes we can bypass if we're not careful. Ephesians chapter 5, if we look at verse 29, Paul writing, and he says in verse 29, so for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. When God, when God built the church, when he established the church, he promised something to sustain it, to give what it needs to live a life of godliness. Second Peter, you go back over there, uh, chapter one, verses two and three. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. That is providence. God has given us everything that we need to live a life of godliness. Don't doubt it. You see, God's promised. He's given us that providence. He called us to a life which he sustains. Man can't sustain this life. We get caught up in the world and we're trying to keep up with the Joneses and trying to get all these new toys and stuff. And we miss out on what God said he'd provide. You remember the disciples when they were being sent out, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. Well, go, well, wait a minute, God, we need food. We need sandals. We need cloaks. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom and his right." God will add these things to you. People are killing themselves trying to get something that God has promised he'd just give to them. If they would seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. Come on now. We can do this. We don't want to be like the world and doubt what God says he'll provide. We have that promise. That we don't doubt God's power. Remember in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus was talking to the soldier, said, you go, well, what do we do? The soldier said, Jesus didn't say quit being a soldier, right? He said, go out and don't take more money than what you're supposed to take. Be content with your wages. Folks, this is the idea. This is where we're missing. That word being content means unfailing strength. God will provide you with the strength to survive. We are out there taking more than what we, you know, need. Because our little feeble minds go, oh, I need more. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 23rd Psalm. I don't need anything. That word want is, means to lack. I am not lacking in anything. 
God makes sure that I'm sustained. We don't doubt God's peace. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, Paul's talking about all the downfalls of physical life that he went through, but he said, you know what? It works out for good. You imagine that? God said he's going to work it all out for good, and Paul agrees with him, and he says, yeah, because when I am weak, when I'm at my weakest point, then I am strong because God is my strength. I find out that I am not strong enough to do it, and I turn to God. Now I'm at my strongest point. And don't doubt God's protection. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul said, I've come to find out, I've come to learn to be content in no matter what circumstance I'm in. You know, I look out in this wonderful group of people here today, and not of all of us, are lucky to be able to sit by the one we want to, so to say, right? But we're content with the one that we are sitting by, right? We, because if we want more than what God is providing for us, then we doubt God. You understand? We doubt God. Every one of us, when we want more than what God has provided, then we doubt God. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that God doesn't like us doing good or doing better. What he says is, when you doubt God, you put him to the back burner. You make things your idols. You put things before God. If you'll trust God, seek him and his kingdom and his righteousness, then God will add these things. This is the idea that we're saying. This is what God is trying to get across to us. The contentment that we find as Christians, the contentment we find in our marriages, the contentment we find in our fellowship, it makes the, 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 the unity stronger. What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. God has brought these wonderful things together through his grace and not man's stupidity. Contentment is strength. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evil. And some people have lusted after, went after and tried to get it and fell away from the faith because they're not content with what God has given us. God promises us victory, folks. And the promise is up for us to have faith in. We don't doubt God's providence. He not only promises victory, he gives us what we need to have that victory. You know, man is very confusing. You ever had those things pop up on your computer that really test your knowledge? There's a, a, a new game show out on TV called The 1% or something. And they have all these mind-boggling, you know, scenarios. So I want to ask you today, which is correct? The yolk of egg are white? Or the yolk of egg is white? Which one's correct? Well, if you really look, neither one are correct. Correct, because a yolk of an egg isn't white. I said that to say this, life can be confusing when we doubt. If we don't trust God, if we let the world tell us what they have, then we lose sight of what God offers. We lose sight of our faith. Faith is staying free, the freedom that God has given us. Stay free from the troubles of doubt. Don't let the world infiltrate your mind. God has given us the power we need to be success successful. He's given us the promises. His promises are gold. And he's given us his providence. He's given us everything we need to leave this world victors. It all starts with hearing the word of God. And believe me, folks, you heard that today. We went to a lot of different scriptures looking at what God is saying. What he is saying to you right now today is if you are here, and you are still lost in sin, quit doubting God. God has given us a plan to, to put our faith in Him, to allow that sin to pierce our heart, and to cry out to Him for a clean conscience through the waters of baptism. Today, if you're here and you're not being baptized, then you haven't let God cleanse your life. You haven't let God start the transformation process. This is not something we want. What we want is for you to be saved. Today, if we can help you, we'll do that. 
but you're not the only people that might need help. Even those of us that believe in God, trust in his power, we still have troubles. If there's something out there going on in your life as a Christian, somebody who's obeyed the gospel, that Satan is trying to use to get you to doubt God, God says, give it to him and he'll take care of it. Don't doubt him. If there's something in your life that you need help with, today you're in the right place to find that help. Struggling marriages, struggling finances, struggling love. Those things are all things that God will work us through if we'll let him. We'll help you today, lead you to the waters of baptism to wash away your sin or say a prayer with you, study with you, hug you, find ways to strengthen your foothold in the mighty body of Christ. We'll do that today if you'll let us. Please take this opportunity right now to stand. Uh, come forward as we stand and we sing.